Well, this is a really good crowd today. Um, I think it's probably because, like everyone, I'm really struggling to understand where we are uh, in the UK politically, economically, but also where we are in the uh, commercial property cycle. In putting the presentation together today, I have to say that it suddenly dawned on me that uh, I think a couple of the key themes that I have have been the same themes that I've had ever since 2015. Uh, does this mean that I've run out of uh, new ideas? <laughs> no, 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 I've got plenty of ideas, but I would say that, uh, not to give Betty sort of uh, too much publicity, but uh, Alex Fishbaum also wrote a piece apparently about Brexit some time ago, and he, he, he's a bit like me, he hasn't really changed his view at all, which can only mean that we must have gotten it right, hey Alex? <laughs> anyway, uh, so look, a couple of things I want to say is in, in the, <clears throat> I was looking at uh, this chart just to kind of get back to the, the cyclical question and uh, try to decide whether, uh, in fact, we're going to have some sort of uh, uh, adjustment over the course of the next five years. And what I see is an absolutely uh, striking correlation between total returns to UK commercial property and real GDP. As a matter of fact, it's so close that uh, it really begs the question of why we bother to have forecasters at all, uh, except that the uh, uh, total returns to property tend to precede uh, real GDP by about one year, which also means that we're either all very clever or probably more likely uh, very cautious and probably invest other people's money, so we tend to uh, uh, try to diminish the risk before the market does, does generally turn. But what I would suggest to you is that uh, over the, the last five years, you can see there in the yellow just you can see that the uh, total returns have flattened out according to the IPF consensus quite considerably, uh, and the economy in the same time is, uh, is meant to grow. I'm not sure it'll completely uh, play out that way, and I would point out that uh, one thing about forecasts is they all tend to revert to mean, which means that ultimately they are all generally meaningless, but there you go. <clears throat> so where does the UK uh, sit at the moment? Generally the economy, there's been a lot of negative press, and so I just wanted to put it in the context of what we see uh, uh, globally. I uh, have uh, on the left-hand side uh, the economic growth forecast annualized from 2018 to 2022. And you can see that uh, the U.S. is leading the pack at about 2%. Um, Canada is at about 1.8, 1.9. Uh, UK at about 1.8. And France is about the same. And then the Eurozone is uh, lagging at about 1.6 or, or so uh, going forward. Uh, I think it's a really interesting pattern. So Anglo-America seems to be leading the pack, and I think there's reasons for that. Uh, if you look at the uh, projection of the U Eurozone compared to the UK, which should be of great interest given the, the Brexit gyrations we're going through, in fact, what you see is a cooling of the Eurozone. I think we're probably peaking about now, uh, and this starts to come off. Uh, I think even German performance is uh, forecast to be somewhere around 1.3, 1.4 over that particular period. Uh, at the same time, uh, the UK rebounds back. Presumably, Brexit goes OK, I suppose. And we're back up at around 2% over the course of the next few years. Now, this is Oxford economic forecasts. And uh, uh, are they better than the rest? Are they not as good as the rest? Well, what I will say is they're kind of in the middle. So they're not extreme in any particular way. And I've never really seen any sort of political bias that comes out of Oxford economics either. I would argue, and this is one of the main themes that I had as far back as 2015, uh, that I think demographic pressure and growth is the key driver of the global economies, certainly the Western advanced economies. And I give you this slide here. Uh, in blue, it shows total population growth forecast over the course of the next 10 years. Uh, and in red, it shows the growth, or lack thereof, of the working age population. And if you look at it, Canada, US, and UK, uh, it almost lines perfectly with the other sorts of forecasts. <coughs> which will say, well, yeah, Walter, but those other forecasts must be based on demographic projections. And you'd be absolutely right, because I called them and asked. And uh, it could be something like 30 to 40% of the explanatory value, as it were. But nevertheless, I think that pattern is absolutely key. And I think the thing that's been keeping the UK going over the course of the last couple of years, despite Brexit, has been this link with the real support of the economy. And I think that will continue to play out. If you run across the spectrum, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, uh, Germany is actually in quite negative territory, and this is one of the reasons I think that the projections for economic growth in Germany are uh, that much more limited. You go a little bit further, you can see Russia is probably one of the uh, most uh, challenged economies, you could say. Uh, the joke I make here, which uh, isn't necessarily that funny, is that um, if you're worried about Russian military aggression or adventurism, 
you got to ask yourself what the army is going to look like in a couple of years, you know? <laughs> but you say, but Walter, you say, uh, yeah, but what about this uh, population growth story? You know, the UK will get ready to slam the door on immigrants. I'm not so you know, sure about that. What I would say is if you look at the numbers, about half of the uh, growth in UK population is attributed to natural growth. The other half is immigration. And of that uh, half of immigration, half of that, again, uh, comes from the EU. Now, I give you this chart here, which shows uh, the Sterling Index as compared to net migration. And I have a sneaky suspicion that what's happened over the course of the last couple of years wasn't so much that uh, immigrants uh, from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, for instance, uh, feel any less welcome here. Maybe they do. But I think it's all been about the weakness in Sterling. And if, in fact, uh, you can't repatriate as much money back to your homeland, uh, maybe you just stop in Germany, which is about halfway here, uh, and do the work there, since, uh, since the advantage of coming to Britain isn't quite as great. And I suspect that when sterling reverts back to its long-term parity value, which is likely in the next five years, and rises by about another 10 or 15%, then there'll be more pressure uh, for coming in from uh, those regions again. And at that same time, I think there'll be general recognition in the UK that, look, we need people in the health service, we need people in the care homes, we need people you know, in, in labor and warehousing and in uh, agriculture and all the rest of it. And I suspect that that'll be part of the ultimate compromise that the, the UK makes. Uh, if you look regionally in the UK, and I think this story probably plays out across Europe too. I should have stuck in a few European cities. I think that the growth potential of certain destinations, and this is also from a property investment point of view, are going to be driven by, you know, the ongoing urbanization that we have. Uh, Edinburgh, again, has pretty strong growing working force population. London, of course, is uh, the strongest. Uh, Bristol's comes up pretty high in the charts. Birmingham, um, I've got Somerset there for other reasons, but not, let's not worry about Somerset too much. Although I tell you what, it does, it does illustrate the point that outside, it does uh, illustrate the point that outside of urban areas, uh, the UK is generally challenged with an aging population more so than in urban areas. But I think too, if you combine this, and I don't want to get into the story too much, with the devolution policy that we're seeing and the new elected mayors and some of the new regional economic development initiatives that are coming through, you're going to find a pretty co close correlation. And if you're looking for secondary markets for opportunities, I think these are the kind of, this is the kind of data that you need to look at to work out where to look, not just here, but also in Europe. Just to show you what I mean, what I've done here is I've taken purchasing manager indices on a monthly basis and averaged them over two periods. In blue is the period from August 2013, which is when I think we finally turned out of the, the malaise of the Great Recession, to June 16, which is, of course, when we voted to leave the EU. That's in blue, and so you can see it's all reasonably strong. It's all expansionary, with the exception of Scotland, which has a different set of problems, and Northern Ireland, which has another unique set of problems. But since 2016, August 16, <coughs> excuse me, you can see that the whole thing becomes slightly compressed, which suggests that there was some sort of hit from Brexit. Now, you could argue, well, Walter, that's just normal cyclical economic cooling, and that was going on at the time, so there is an element of that, except that the, the pattern geographically is actually quite interesting. So you can see London actually came down uh, quite significantly, and that's because I think the main impact on Brexit on the UK economy has been on the finance sector and those allied industries that support it, you know, a lot of what, what we do, as it were. If you look over at the uh, Southwest, for instance, has a pretty strong financial services exposure. That seems to have been hit. Uh, if you look at the Northeast, that has a bit of a financial services. The mortgage market was based up there for the longest while, big hit. Scotland, of course, has the double whammy. Uh, Edinburgh is hit on the financial services, but equally, they had the oil story. Uh, Northern Ireland actually went up. <laughs> Good for Northern Ireland. I would say there's a huge government exposure there, and I think this reflects an easing of austerity. So there, that's the story. Generally, though, I would say for the UK as a whole that even though it's weakened a bit, it's still an expansionary territory. If we look at the leasing markets across uh, London in blue and, um, and the regions, I've looked at the big six CBDs collectively. I think it sort of confirms the same story. Uh, demand's been expansionary. In 2016, leasing demand in the regional cities actually went up. In London, it went down. Again, there's a question of whether this is cyclical or not, because I can remember back in 2015, you know, we had rents hitting 125, 130 pounds a square foot in the West End. The city was somewhere around 78.50. It seems like it was set for a correction, especially when the new rating regime came in. 
And so consequently, that may well explain why it's come off, because it's bounced right back over the course of the, of the last year. But the diversity of demand for space in London has been absolutely quite extraordinary. As a matter of fact, uh, a guy, uh, Guy Grantham in our uh, Central London <coughs> team put this chart together, which shows that average take up by, uh, U, uh, by North American um, uh, multinationals, European, or I should say North American and European <coughs> headquarter businesses as compared to UK uh, headquarter business have absolutely skyrocketed something about 200% of their long term 10 year average. So demand's been actually really quite robust. I mean, some of this story is like uh, <coughs> Deutsche Bank goes into the press and says, oh, no, we're, we're going, we're going. And then suddenly say, well, we're going to open this new headquarters, by the way. And there's been a lot of uh, other sort of similar stories that come, uh, uh, that come out of this sort of uh, Brexit uh, uh, media. The conclusion I've taken from it is that I think those for, that nobody's going to lift large-scale wholesale a lot of the financial services that we currently use to support, uh, say, the Eurozone now and shift it over to the Eurozone anytime soon. I think it's going to be a very slow process. I think what you're going to see is firms setting up new business service lines in Europe and getting passport rights at the same times. I think the, uh, the EU will eventually say, well, fine, Britain, you're gone. We want to set up our own financial services industry to support our own, our own internal economy, which makes perfect sense and all the rest of it. But you're not going to do that in two years. You're not going to do that in five years. You're going to do that probably in about maybe 10, 15 years. At that point, the technology comes in and all the rest of it. What I see is a bonanza for financial consultants of the UK to advise the EU on how to set up the structure over the course of the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So look, uh, if we get back to property uh, or focus, this is the IPF UK consensus forecast that I mentioned uh, before and how they're pretty flat. The total returns is in green, so you can see in 2017 it was about 10% or so. Uh, then it falls uh, in 18, the forecast, to around 5%, down to 3.7, I think, is a low in 19, and then starts to accelerate. Uh, over the five-year period, the IPF have us at about 4.8% per annum growth uh, in uh, total returns. As you can see, Collier's is assuming its normal market leadership position by saying it's going to be 5.1%, so <clears throat> which isn't much at all. Well, what I see here is uh, extremely low volatility. Uh, we know the yields are uh, pretty low. I think this is a a function of the second key theme I've been following since 2015, and that is just the sheer weight of capital and the ongoing search for yield. Now, what I would suggest to you, and, I, and I've had several people say to me, Walter, Walter, we've got all this money to invest. Uh, where should we put it, right? And I said, well, have you thought about uh, rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty and doing a little bit, maybe a development JV? Oh, no, 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 too management intensive, you know? Uh, have you thought about debt? No, 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 too complicated. You know, it's, uh, it's, we're not going to get the easy double-digit IRRs anymore, I think, is, is the main message. But I also think that there is going to be a shift up the uh, risk curve. Um, uh, already, um, <clears throat> uh, where, what, what was the example I wanted to give? Uh, there's a couple of examples. There's a bit more spec development going on in industrial. But I was talking to a guy that's involved with the banks, <clears throat> or was involved with the banks. He was one of those frustrated bankers that decided to go uh, uh, fun side, so that he could have a bit more fun, as it were, uh, given all the regulatory restrictions on the banks at the moment. They set up a, uh, 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 a lending fund, uh, exactly had the same sort of criteria that the banks had, which means they were having a hard time placing money. <clears throat> so he finally went to the credit committee and said, look, I'd like to set up a, a higher risk lending fund. I said, okay, fine. So they set it up and about, got about 500 million came in very quickly. Uh, and he set up his first deal. I think it was somewhere in Europe, by the way. And uh, went to the credit committee. The credit committee looked at it and said, what is this? What are you bringing? This is, this is nonsense. You know, we're not going to do that. Wait, listen, we set up a high-risk credit fund. And they go, oh, yeah, we did. So I, I think that there's a, a little bits of evidence like that that would suggest that maybe risk is going to come back into the equation. And I wouldn't be surprised, too, if that doesn't spill over to the banking sector. I mean, John Knowles from our team here might have a view. Uh, and the banks may actually start taking on a little bit more risk going forward, and maybe we get something that looks a little bit more like a proper debt cycle in the UK, which I don't think we've really had yet. This is the weight of capital in the world, which I think is the main defining force for UK commercial property. Certainly, there's no other way to explain uh, how we've managed to stay so stable after making one of the most uh, momentous political decisions in uh, an awful long time. Um, latest figures I can put my hands on show that uh, if you just look at institutional global capital alone, it's somewhere up around 
uh, $70 trillion worth of investable funds. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, the allocations to real estate, uh, according to the IPE and uh, Hods and Wild, I think is the other company behind that, is top 10% now. I would point out that a 1% increase in allocations to real estate is equivalent to, uh, well, just the institutional funds, about, is that seven trillion? No, no, it's 10, uh, 700 billion. Uh, I would point out that uh, annual direct investment property is somewhere around one trillion. So it's, listen, it's a lot of, a lot of heavy lifting is in position and there's the search for yield goes on. Uh, if I look at the investment flows into the UK, direct <coughs> commercial property investment, this is just including cross-border, this is all investment. Uh, you can see that we had something of a cyclical peak back in 2015. Uh, you can see that outside of London, there's been a lot of capital going to the regions, which I think is because uh, there's a limited amount of stock that was for sale in London. Uh, those that have it don't really want to sell it, as it were. Um, also, competition is pretty keen for product, too, so I think it's pushed uh, a lot of it out there. But what we now suddenly have is this sort of secondary thing that's looking a bit peakish, which I would argue uh, has all to do with uh, the weight of capital, uh, which makes the whole thing look anti-cyclical, which would suggest that the property cycle, commercial UK commercial property cycle at the moment, is uh, actually buffeted by these anti-cyclical forces. And that's why we're struggling to, uh, to come up with some forecasts that would, uh, that would be anything that is just strictly uh, flat, non-volatile. I will give you this chart. Now, I, I, I hesitate to put this one up because there's a few uh, conceptual problems with uh, defining the, the different segments of investors. The overseas investors are pretty clear, although some of them probably spill over into local domestic funds that uh, do asset management for them. But I think the, the striking thing is that overseas investment has remained pretty much uh, net buyers of real estate. Everything above the line is a net, net buy you're buying more than you're selling. Everything below means you're selling more than you're buying. Over the course of, well, since 2001, I'd say that it's been given a huge impetus, of course, by weaker sterling, uh, and that'll continue to play. But I think what's really quite remarkable is the UK institutions in dark blue. You can see, now, if, if ever there was something that looked cyclical, that's got to be it. And I would point to the very last part of the last couple of years. It looks as if the so-called uh, period of portfolio adjustment uh, rebalancing is that uh, were talked about about a year ago are possibly coming to an end. The question is, is whether this is going to prove to be cyclical and the UK institutions are going to come back in a significant way and add just that much more pressure to the market, especially since yields are coming down to pretty much almost where they were back in 2007, without the debt too, by the way. If we look at the yields, and I did a few uh, uh, look back at the uh, 2007 peak just to see where things were. And I think there's a couple of interesting things come out of this. Blue is uh, where yields are compared to where they were back in 2007. So you can see everything's compressed, with the exception of retail. Uh, nevertheless, I think even though we've got uh, um, that sort of lack of compression, I do think probably, as everybody in the room probably does, that retail is at risk of a, a more significant sort of correction going forward in the softening of yields. It hasn't really come through yet. Although, in certain specific sectors, I think we're starting to see it. And I think across all of these sectors, with the exception of industrial, uh, we're starting to see a mix of, um, of yields starting to shift out in some of the regional markets. And I would argue that it may have a little bit to do with the performance that we saw in the earlier slide, the purchasing manager indices and the local economic <coughs> performance. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, since last year, in orange, yields continue to compress. And only uh, in the last quarter are we starting to see uh, a significant reduction in yield compression. And I think that all of us are waiting for the Q2 data, which will be out in another kind of month or so, uh, to see whether uh, the correction actually starts to come through to any greater degree. I would say that if you look back at the forecasts, uh, um, capital falls look to be reasonably limited. We'll come back to that question in a minute. Another way of predicting where things are headed is to look at the REITs. So it used to be the rule of thumb was that uh, the REITs usually lead the uh, commercial market by about six months. Um, now, what I, f I find so striking about this is I go back to June 16, so you can see the, uh, the result of the EE referendum. Uh, I picked on poor Derwent, only because they represent London really quintessentially, and you can see it was the slowest to recover of all of these. 
Uh, I looked at the regional reaches to see how the regions were doing, and they recovered very rapidly. It stayed pretty steady. Only recently have they started cycling down slightly. I looked at uh, uh, New River Retail just because they're the clever bunch, and uh, they made a pretty good run of it here. They're also, everything seems to have cooled uh, a bit, not, not catastrophically, which would be consistent with the forecasts. And then we have Seagrow, which I argue is a whole different game. It has to do with structural change and, uh, uh, and the linkage, again, to the real economy, which I think is going to be the solid thing going forward. I also mentioned that uh, all this yield compression we've had has really been done without too much uh, bank debt. Uh, there is bank debt out there, and it's being used, don't get me wrong, but the leverage levels that we had are nothing like where we were back in 2007. So if we look at the uh, orange line on the uh, left-hand side, net lending to commercial property is struggling to be positive. Consequently, the bars are showing that the exposure of lending to real estate as a percentage of the total lending book is still falling. Uh, it's got a little bit further to go back to the, where we were back in the uh, 1990s. But nevertheless, uh, there's not a huge impetus coming from the banks. If you look at lending to construction and development, you can see it's positively negative according to the British Bankers Association. The only people that have had a decent run has been some of the house builders on the strength of insatiable demand for, for housing. Uh, what has this all affected? It means that uh, we basically pushed down uh, all property yields, but yet you know, we pushed them down to pretty low level. If you look at the 10-year gilt, we still have something like 400, 500 basis points <coughs> of yield gaps, so there's absolutely no pressure on commercial property pricing coming from underneath, uh, as it were. If we look at the long-term forecast for 10-year bonds, and this again goes back to Oxford Economics, uh, you can see that they edge up is the only way to express it. Um, so that I think if you were to look at really carefully at this and look at the numbers, you'd see that the U.S. peaks in 2021, uh, the U.K. peaks in 2024, um, the Eurozone peaks in 2030, okay, I like I say, mean reversion, and maybe they're, they're meaningless. But I do think that uh, the thing that strikes me funny about this is that uh, usually when interest rates peaks, what, what happens after that? Yeah, yeah, somebody got it there. Usually a recession follows, doesn't it? So I don't think that Oxford Economics had it in their mind to try to be uh, forecasting, that sort of thing. But I do think that it does show that the US, as typical, is usually ahead in the cycle, uh, likely to uh, peak after the next election in 2021. UK will follow thereafter. I don't think it will necessarily be 2024, but it'll probably be uh, sometime thereafter the Eurozone. That's, uh, it's a really complicated story to tell at the moment. Nevertheless, I guess the message from this is that this transition to this new normal that we're coming to looks to be slightly more benevolent than the last normal back in 2007. So I don't see a huge amount of pressure on uh, UK commercial property pricing coming from the bond market. I just finished by summing up and saying, there's a lot of different things that make, uh, I don't want to say it's different this time, but there's circumstances, I think, that are mitigating some of the corrections that we might see. Um, this is a list that was put together by Oxford Economics uh, some time ago uh, to try to quantify the effect that various things have on holding down the bond rates. And again, uh, one of the key themes, demographic aging fits in. Um, this is savings glut. We've got about another 15 years worth of uh, uh, baby boomers retiring from various parts of the world, and they reckon that's creating a pressure of about 100 basis points on holding yields down. Quantitative easing, okay, now there's talk now about pulling it out of the system, but that is going to be so unbelievably gradual. We're basically going to grow, grow ourselves and fight our, our way out of the, uh, the huge amount of debt. The U.S. has stopped expanding and they've stopped reinvesting the earnings coming off the bond holdings. Uh, the U.K. is stable. Uh, the Eurozone is now talking about stopping buying bonds. They're still actually expanding as we speak. That's going to be a very slow process. Again, 100 basis points of yields is the, is the pressure. I could go through a lot of these, and some of these are actually uh, quite uh, uh, erudite. Income inequality. <clears throat> the more inequality the income, the greater the savings rate because people who already have money don't need to do much with it so they can save it, you know, and all the rest of it. But I'd leave it to you to re look at this in your leisure.